Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the inaugural webinar for the Great Lakes Islands Alliance. We're really excited today to be able to connect you, um, the island communities, with the latest information and experts on subjects that are important to you. My name is Matt Pricer. I work in the Michigan office of the Great Lakes. Uh, one of my roles is to serve as the coordinator for the Great Lakes Islands Alliance, or GLIA, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Just a very brief overview of what, what will go down in the next hour. Um, I'll provide a bit of a background on the Alliance. Um, we'll do a live poll, uh, which will help us gauge a little bit better who uh, you are, our audience, uh, your background, uh, and also how well this tool, this webinar works um, to be able to reach you. Uh, the future presentation will be about 30 minutes, and as Luke uh, indicated, we will be saving time at the end for question and answer. Now, to start off with, um, throughout the Great Lakes, there are <clears throat> 32,000 islands. Um, this is obviously an incredible figure and one that many people, frankly, do not know about. Uh, I call it one of the best kept secrets uh, in the Great Lakes. This map shows you the approximate distribution of the islands um, across each Great Lake. Now, the far majority of those are small and uninhabited, um, but they do uh, serve valuable habitats for uh, plant and animal life. Now, the number of islands in the Great Lakes actually fluctuates over time due to fluctuating water levels. So, for example, when the, in high water, some of the smallest islands will actually disappear, and in low water, new ones will be formed. Now, if we're talking about the inhabited islands of the Great Lakes, there are roughly 30. Some of these are far offshore and reachable only by boat or plane. Others are close enough for a bridge or a tunnel. The communities are individually unique, obviously, uh, but one thing they have in common is that they are surrounded on all sides by water, and that presents both challenges and opportunities. Who is the GLIA, the Great Lakes Islands Alliance? This is a new network that's forming between these populated island communities. It is a voluntary partnership that is for islands by islands. And again, while each of these communities is distinct in geography and history and character, the participants are finding that their communities have much in common with one another, often more so than the adjacent mainland. And so the idea behind the network is that it affords the opportunity for islanders to connect with one another and share ideas and particularly solutions to the various challenges of island living. And this map shows you the, uh, where we have our members come from. Um, we have Islander members uh, that come from a variety of sectors and walks of life, uh, including local government officials, uh, business people, non-government organizations, educators, and more. Presently, we have members, participants from 14 of the island communities, and I'll scroll through them very quickly here, starting with Madeline Island up in Lake Superior, Washington Island, Beaver Island, and in Northern Lake Huron, there's a small cluster, Le Chineau, Mackinac, and Bablo, or Bois Blanc, Nebish Island up in the St. Mary's River, Drummond Island, is next. Then the next is Manitoulin Island, the largest freshwater island on the planet. Going further south, Harsons. And then in Lake Erie, there's another cluster, uh, Middle Bass, South Bass Island, which is also known as Putin Bay, Kelly's Island, and Pelee Island, which is in the Ontario waters of Lake Erie. To learn more, we hope you visit our website very simply, greatlakesislandsalliance.org. You may also contact me uh, at the information shown. In case you're wondering, uh, I am located in Lansing, Michigan, which is ironically and unfortunately about as far from an island in the Great Lakes as you can physically get. Now, I did one final comment. Uh, you will notice several Michigan entities uh, involved in the webinar today. Uh, the GLIA serves the entire region. I wanted to stress that, uh, regardless of political boundaries and what lake you're in. We're definitely um, open and uh, seeking additional partners and island community members. So, as a segue to the presentation,
just again the uh, onto the purpose, I guess, of today. So the the Great Lakes Islands Alliance. One of the services we like to do is to be able to connect island communities with the latest information on you know subjects and experts of interest to them. Due to the enormous geography of the lakes and the cost and logistics of having to travel to meetings, we determined that uh, doing this virtually through this internet-based tool would be the way to, to go. Uh, obviously, it's free and it can be watched anywhere, and as Luke indicated, it will be recorded so you can share it with others in your community after the fact. This is the first, uh, our kickoff webinar, hopefully it's the first of many. And when, we, uh, when the GLIA members asked for subject matter, uh, the, the membership came back with Great Lakes water levels as the number one choice. And really it's a fitting way for us to begin given that island communities are literally defined by Great Lakes water. So I'm happy to introduce today's speaker. Really this is one of the leading researchers in the entire region on this subject. So we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Drew Bronwald with us. Drew is a physical scientist with NOAA, that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Ann Arbor. And he's also an adjunct professor at the University of Michigan. Welcome, Drew. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Matt. And um, at this point, I believe folks should be able to see my screen okay. Um, yep, it's looking good. Great, thanks. So why don't I dive right in? Um, Matt, thanks again for the introduction. Thanks for everyone at, at MSU and, and Extension and Sea Grant for helping co-host uh, this event. It's an, it's an honor to be, to be here and to be sharing information on water levels. And I want to start out by noting that um, today's talk on water levels is going to be uh, hopefully an informative, but also a relatively cursory overview uh, of a broad range of topics related to water levels. And when we're finished, I know there's going to be time for questions, but I do encourage you to work with the folks at Sea Grant and MSU Extension um, to get back in touch with us to see if we can continue getting you information that might be helpful for you on water levels. So um, to begin with, I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of an introduction to the work that we do at our laboratory and where water levels work fits into that context. And after that brief introduction, take a look at long-term water level variability over a variety of different time and space scales. I then want to talk about um, what factors influence the Great Lakes water balance, in particular, the major factors of the Great Lakes water balance, that is the amount of water entering and leaving the Great Lakes system. Uh, I then want to talk about how we take our understanding of the relationship between the water balance and water levels and turn that into computer models that are used for simulations, forecasts over seasonal and long-term timescales, and then finally leave you with some conclusions and some parting thoughts. So to begin with, um, I, I work for NOAA here at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, and the majority of the work that I and many of my colleagues do really does focus on understanding the complex nature of systems that govern the Great Lakes, not just the physical system, but also the biological system and chemical system as well. This image that you see is a rather unique one that was taken in December 1999 uh, from a NASA satellite, and it's an unconventional view of the lakes. We're looking from west to east across the Great Lakes system. Um, now, on my pointer, I'm uncertain if um, where the red dot is pointing right now. Could someone confirm if the red dot is hovering over the small Lake Nipigon right now? Yes. Okay, great. So um, if you follow the red dot here, here we are in the western portion of Lake Superior. Here is the northern shoreline of Lake Superior. And then over here, we have the western shoreline of Lake Michigan. This satellite image was taken in December of 1999. And there's a few interesting features to note. One is you can see the um, heterogeneity of features across the landscape. So if you look at the land surface, you can see there's extensive snow cover along upper Minnesota, Canada, and Wisconsin. But as we get down here into Michigan and Ohio, you can see that the land surface is relatively bare with respect to snow cover. Um, and then if you look at the surfaces of the lakes, you also can see the scale, the magnitude, and the spatial variability of the processes. What we're actually seeing here is the transfer of water vapor off the surface of the lakes, also known as evaporation. Um, November and December are typically the times of year 
when cold water is moving across the Great Lakes system and the lakes are cooling. And that cooling process releases energy, much of it in the form of water vapor that is effectively evaporation and water loss from the lakes. In 1999, the Great Lakes were experiencing one of their most profound water level declines in history. So I like to start off with this image because it captures so much of what we're trying to understand about the Great Lakes system in terms of spatial scale, spatial heterogeneity, and the complexity of the processes involved. Um, our laboratory also works a lot with partners in the region on understanding the fate and transport of pollutants. Here's a classic image of Lake Erie undergoing um, the formation of harmful algal blooms. For reference here, you can see here's southern Lake Huron. Here's the St. Clair River flowing down through Lake St. Clair um, through the Detroit River. And then here is the extensive um, bloom in western Lake Erie. Um, just for reference here, water has been flowing out um, of the eastern end of Lake Erie through the Niagara River. Here, of course, is Peely Island, and there's other geographic information here. Now, it's not just summertime and fall blooms that we're trying to understand, uh, or summertime hydrodynamics. We also do a lot of work on wintertime um, features, in particular, the faint transport of ice cover across the lakes that has a huge impact not only on surface temperatures and heat content, but also on evaporation and ultimately has a close connection to long-term water levels. This is the same image here. You can see some interesting um, ice breakup in the southern portion of Lake Huron here, um, the free-flowing river down into frozen Lake St. Clair. Um, but I like to use this image to underscore the magnitude of the ice changes that are occurring out in the middle of Lake Erie, a lot of which people don't experience because of their proximity to the coast, but it's certainly folks who live on islands and folks who have an appreciation of the offshore dynamics recognize that these things are happening all winter long and, again, can have a profound impact on the entire Great Lake system at the tail end and the beginning of the season. Hey, hey so, Drew, this is Matt. I'm sorry to interrupt, but just to let you know, yeah. your, your red cursor, there is a bit of a, a time lag, I think. Yep. Um, okay. And so just to let you know that it's not always uh, quickly following with your, your words. Great. Thanks for letting me know. I appreciate it. Okay. So... What I want to do next is talk about, um, look at historical water level data, where it comes from, and the range of variability. So uh, to start off with, let's just do a quick orientation to the um, hydrologic system. This is a relatively conventional map of the Great Lakes system. The brown region that you see there is the boundary of the Great Lakes Basin or the watershed. Um, all the water that falls from precipitation on that um, brown, greenish area works its way through the Great Lakes system and out through the St. Lawrence River. So in general, water that falls within Lake Superior's uh, watershed and onto Lake Superior flows down through the St. Mary's River into Lake Huron. Now, simultaneously, water within the Lake Michigan and Lake Huron Basin is collecting within this system and typically interchanges through the Straits of Mackinac. A lot of times you'll see from a long-term hydrological perspective Scientists will refer to Lake Michigan and Lake Huron as one large lake system, also known as Lake Michigan Huron. And in the rest of my talk, you'll see me refer to that, again, as one large lake system from a long-term hydrologic perspective. Uh, water then flows down through Lake Huron, out through the St. Clair River, past Detroit, through the Detroit River, um, across Lake Erie, um, out through the Niagara River, down into Lake Ontario, and then out through the St. Lawrence River. Um, if we take a slightly different perspective on the Great Lakes using a hydraulic profile, we can see sort of where the elevation changes take place and what's driving much of that um, flow rate. So I actually want to start over here on the right-hand side of the image where we are looking at the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and that's where our benchmark elevations are effectively for water levels on the Great Lakes. So when we see water level elevations, they're typically referenced relative to this zero benchmark near the Atlantic Ocean. So if we go back over to the left-hand side of this image, we can see here the profile, a rough profile of Lake Superior with this flat, uh, long-term average water level of about 600 feet. Water then flowing through the St. Mary's River. We'll talk more about the Sioux Locks and the um, compensating works at Sault Ste. Marie. Water flowing through Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, all part of this one profile here, flowing down through the St. Clair River, through the Detroit River into Lake Erie, and then this profound drop um, as water flows through the Niagara River, over Niagara Falls, and into Lake Ontario. 
And then there are a series of, of dams and control structures um, at the exit of Lake Ontario down towards the St. Lawrence River. One of the most profound uh, is the Moses Saunders Power Dam that was constructed in the early 1960s that is integral to the Lake Ontario system and fluctuations in water levels. So that just gives you an idea of sort of the layout of the lakes and how water in general flows through the system, including elevation changes and also the basis for the elevation numbers that we'll talk about later. So in terms of water level data and how we understand um, changes in water levels, the, the, the primary source of information are water level gauging stations like this one. This particular um, gauging station is owned and operated by NOAA through the National Ocean Service. It's located in Mackinac City. Uh, the, the water level gauging equipment is actually inside this, this housing right here. And you can see there's other meteorological equipment that is co-located with that station that measures things like relative humidity, air temperature, and other variables. Um, there are roughly 50 stations like this along the U.S. portion of the Great Lakes and about half that many on the Canadian side that are owned and operated by the Canadian federal government. And together those form what we commonly refer to as the Great Lakes Water Level Monitoring Network. And when we put the data from all of those stations together, we get a very long and robust uh, record of Great Lakes water levels. And so I'm gonna change my cursor here. Let me see if I can get rid of that, okay. So what we have here is a long-term record of water levels on the Great Lakes that comes from those monitoring stations. I wanna point out that we're looking at four different sets of data, one for each of the lake systems. At the bottom of your page along the x-axis, we've got a time scale here going from uh, the early 1900s up until roughly present. And then on the vertical axis here, we're looking at water surface elevations, this time in meters. For Great Lakes water levels, we often convert back and forth between feet and meters. This is a binational resource. We're working closely between the United States uh, and Canadian federal governments. So these numbers here represent those water surface elevations. And I want you to note that the scaling between the numbers is consistent across all the lakes. Although I've inserted gaps here to represent major drops in elevation between the lakes, just to make the image clear. So for example, if we look here at Lake Superior's water levels, you can see here that in light blue, I have monthly average water levels. And in dark blue, I have annual average water levels. For each of the data sets, I also have a red line going through the data set that represents the long-term average. So a few key features to point out with each, with each one of these data sets. Um, the first of which is that these gray bars that you see here for Lake Superior and for Lake Ontario represent the approximate timing when these construction of these compensating works were put in place um, for Lake Superior at Sault Ste. Marie and for Lake Ontario at the Moses Saunders Dam. Um, so the construction of the compensating works at Lake Superior has relatively minimal impact on long-term water levels and outflows. Um, but the compensating works at Lake Ontario, as you can see in this image, had a much more profound on the rate of interannual variability in water levels over the long-term record. And you can see that just by looking at the um, water level record before the construction of the dam and the water level variability after the dam. Now, a few other features I want to point out in this record. One is that if you look at the light blue dots, you can see the strong seasonal cycle of month-to-month -month water level change across the Great Lakes system. If you look at the annual water levels, you can see there's also a broad range of variability in year-to-year -year changes on the Great Lakes, particularly on the Lake Michigan-Huron system. If we highlight some of those um, features, we can look in the 1960s where water levels across the system were at lows. And in fact, on the Lake Michigan-Huron system, the mid-1960s were when a series of record lows were set for that time. We can move forward in time to when water levels were near record highs, particularly for the Michigan-Huron and Erie system. This is a period when there was um, significant erosion, houses were falling into the lake. And again, on the Lake Michigan-Huron system, not only were water level, high water level records set at that time, but it's important to note that water levels on the Lake Michigan-Huron system during this peak in the 1980s were roughly five to six feet higher than they were during the record lows in the 1960s. That's a pretty broad range of long-term water levels for a system this size. If we march forward in time again, we can see a period worth noting when in the late 1990s, water levels were at a, a peak, 
but then decline very rapidly across the entire system, particularly on Michigan, Huron, and Erie, leading to a period of persistent below average water levels that many of you on the phone probably remember and have experienced directly when water levels were below average on the Michigan, Huron, and Superior system. And right at the time when there was profound discussion on drivers of water level change, on impacts of climate change and dredging in the um, around 2013, 2014, water levels across the Great Lakes went on a remarkable surge. In fact, during that three to four year period, uh, a record was set for the highest rate of water level increase ever recorded for Lake Superior and Lake Michigan Huron. Throughout all this time period, um, we here at the NOAA Great Lakes Research Lab, along with our partners, our academic partners, and elsewhere all across the Great Lakes, work to get this information to the public. And one way we do that is through articles like this one. Um, this was a cover article in the, in the journal EOS, where we talked about that, that surge in Great Lakes water levels. And the cover image um, used to represent that story is this sort of iconic image of the uh, Chicago Lake shoreline. And you can see here waves crashing over the, the iconic Chicago uh, bike path right along the shoreline there, right during this time period in 2014 and 2015. Um, really a remarkable change in conditions over the long term. Now, we use water level data not only to understand long-term changes in Great Lakes water levels, but also short-term changes as well, induced by short-term climate events and also short-term meteorological events. This particular image here is of Hurricane Sandy. And we all know that Hurricane Sandy had a profound impact on the marine coast, but a lot of the water level data we've looked at over time is to help us understand the impact of events like this on the Great Lakes. I want you to note quickly, if you could, the counterclockwise um, rotation of the hurricane and the potential impact that that's going to have on the lakes in terms of wind direction and wave action. So what I want to do next is <clears throat> let's take a look at water level data from this time period. I have two panels on the screen. The top panel is I'm going to use to show Great Lakes data. And on the bottom panel, I'm going to show to you, uh, use to show data from um, New York City. You can see that the vertical axes here for the upper panel are elevations in meters. And then on the bottom right here, there are also elevations in meters relative effectively to mean sea level. They both cover a range of six meters, just the Great Lakes water levels are about 175 meters above those of the marine coast. So first, I wanna identify the time period when Hurricane Sandy was at its peak. Um, this is late October of 2012, moving into early November of 2012. So first I wanna add in water level data from the Fort Gratiot gauge, which is in Southern Lake Huron. I then wanna add in a water level gauge from Buffalo, New York, at the eastern end of Lake Erie. And then finally, add in a water level gauge from Battery Park in New York City. And there are several important features I wanna note here that underscore what happens when we have a strong meteorological events across the Great Lakes system. The first is this profound rise in water levels at Fort Gratiot at the southern end of Lake Huron. You can see uh, an abrupt rise here, and then during the peak of the hurricane, uh, another a more profound rise. Ultimately, water levels pushed up at the southern end of Lake Huron by about four to five feet during that uh, strong wind event. And what's interesting about that is not only is that a huge rise in water levels for the southern end uh, of Lake Huron, but the majority of the water that was being pushed up there was actually working its way down through um, the St. Clair River into Lake St. Clair and down through the Detroit River. If we move down here, we can see there's much less of an impact on Lake Erie, although you do see a rebound here on Lake Erie's water levels as the storm subsided. And then of course, if we look at the Battery Park gauge, we can see the profound impact on water levels during the peak of the storm as well. Now, a second point I wanna make has to do with these spikes in the Lake Erie water level that you see. These spikes in water level are due to wind-induced stage events um, that cause the lake effectively to splash back and forth. And the point I wanna make here is that these wind-induced stage, S-E-I-C-H-E events, are really on the same magnitude as these tidal events that happen along the marine coast. But the take home message is that they are dangerous, frequent, and much less predictable than the tides on the marine coast. You can look at tide charts um, and give you, give you a very clear picture and, and tide information 
that predict um, almost perfectly these tidal excursions for the marine coast. But these spikes that you see here that happen on the Great Lakes are due to sporadic meteorological events that, again, are much harder to predict. And that's a really important point when we look at um, short-term water levels and the goal of protecting human health and property across the Great Lakes. One last point I want to make in terms of water level variability that I'm not going to capture in my discussion of the Great Lakes water balance directly has to do with glacial isostatic rebound. Um, this image comes from a paper um, published by some colleagues who looked at isostatic rebound. And what it's showing is this phenomenon by which the surface of the Earth's crust is actually rising in response to the loss of pressures due to recession of the, the glaciers from the last ice age. So 10 to 15,000 years ago, glaciers covered this region. Uh, and as they began to retreat to the north, it was almost as if you had a 45 pound uh, weight resting on a posturepedic mattress for a very long time that depressed that posturepedic mattress. And then as you slowly begin to slide that 45 pound weight off of the mattress, the mattress would begin to regain its form, but in an uneven way over time. What's happening right now is that the most northern part of the land surface of the Great Lakes is rising at a more rapid rate than the southern part. And you see that in these numbers here. So for example, if we look along the north shore of Lake Superior and Georgian Bay, we can see the land surface there is rising at a rate relative to the rest of the region at around 30 to 50 centimeters per century. Now that may not sound very fast, but on geological timescales, that is flying. If we think about infrastructure, cottages and homes that might have been built along that shoreline over generations, let's say 50 to 80 years ago, what this means is that infrastructure on that shoreline has literally risen anywhere between a foot to and a foot and a half over that time period relative to the long-term water levels. And as you can see, the opposite is true for some of the areas in the Southern Great Lakes, particularly down near Southern Lake Michigan and Chicago. So the point here is that this is something that has a pretty profound impact on perceptions of water level change, but it's something that's not often discussed or talked about. So let's shift gears next into looking at the major components of, of the Great Lakes hydrologic cycle and the Great Lakes water balance. So on the left here, I wanna start off by identifying what are really the three major components of the Great Lakes water balance. And those are runoff, over lake precipitation, and over lake evaporation. Runoff is the amount of water that comes into each lake based on precipitation that falls on the land surface around each lake and then eventually works its way into the lake through rivers and streams, often being stored as snow in the wintertime and then making its way in during the spring melt. So what I have here for each one of the lakes, and I'll use Lake Superior as an example, is an indication of the magnitude, the long-term magnitude of each one of those components. So for example, in green here, I have the relative magnitude of runoff for Lake Superior in units of thousands of cubic meters per second. Now that may sound a little bit strange, but um, cubic meters per second is often a, often a common flow measurement for uh, water, water systems of this size. So we're looking here at about 1,600 cubic meters per second of annual average flow coming into Lake Superior from runoff. And what's remarkable about this system is that the amount of water that enters Lake Superior from precipitation just onto the lake surface alone is actually more than that. Um, it's around 2,000 cubic meters per second. And then the amount of water lost is around 1.4 thousand cubic meters per second or 1,400 cubic meters per second. Then you can see that, that we use the same sort of numbering convention or at least the pattern for the other lakes as well. What's truly remarkable about the Great Lakes um, is that given the high ratio of water to land across the basin in terms of surface area, we have precipitation, evaporation, and runoff are really on similar scales, and there's really no other freshwater system on Earth for which that's, also, for which that's true. Now, on the right-hand side of this image, I want to add in another component of the water balance, and that is the rate at which water flows between the lakes through what we often refer to as connecting channels. Um, in this case, the St. Mary's River, St. Clair, Detroit River, Niagara River, and St. Lawrence River. So for example, we see here that on long-term average, around 2,200 cubic meters per second of flow 
goes from Lake Superior into Lake Huron through the St. Mary's River. As we work our way through the St. Clair and Detroit Rivers, we're looking at about 5,500 cubic meters per second. And by the time we get to the St. Lawrence River, around 7,000 cubic meters per second. I want to point out that these flow rates are some of the highest continental flow rates for North America. Uh, by the time the St. Lawrence River reaches the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the annual, the long-term average flow rate is really not that dissimilar from the Mississippi River flow, um, although the Mississippi River flow has much greater variability than the St. Lawrence River flow on a monthly and interannual time scale. So here is a snapshot of really what we consider the major ins and outs of water throughout the entire Great Lakes system. Now, one of the things we here at NOAA, along with our partners across the region, particularly our partners at the Army Corps of Engineers and our partners in Canada, uh, is try to turn the information that we have about the drivers of water levels, changes in the water balance, into computer models that we can use to simulate changes in water levels, and ideally, forecast changes in water levels over different time periods. So I want to give you a couple of examples of this work. What I'm using here is a tool that we developed in partnership with our colleagues across the, the top of the panel here. This is a snapshot from a tool called the Great Lakes Water Levels Dashboard. That it's, an, it's an interactive tool available on the internet. You can see the link at the very bottom there that allows you to customize a screen to look at water level data for any of the Great Lakes across any time period that you choose. Um, I've simply customized this particular screen to show just Lake Michigan Huron and just Lake Erie. So if you look at the time scale here, I've, I've chosen to adjust the time scale to go from around 2004 up to roughly present. Um, the vertical axis here, again, are water levels in meters relative to effectively the sea level. Michigan Huron in the top panel and Lake Erie in the bottom panel. And these blue dots that you see here are actual monthly water levels throughout this time period. With the click of a mouse in the dashboard, I can add um, a perspective view on record water levels across this time period. The light blue dashes that you see here at the top are the record highs for each month of the year on the Lake Michigan Huron system. And the red dashes you see here at the bottom are the record lows for each month in the Lake Michigan Huron system. And you can see how throughout this um, period in the 2000s, water levels on the Michigan Huron system were very low. And in fact, here in December of 2012 and January of 2013, water levels on the Lake Michigan Huron system hit new record lows right before embarking on this record setting surge over the subsequent years. Um, you can see here the same pattern on Lake Erie in terms of um, our portrayal of the record highs and the record lows for each month of the year. Now with a mouse click, I can add in what the slide is really intending to show is where forecasts within this range. So I've just clicked the mouse and added in um, forecasts that come from a modeling system run by the Army Corps of Engineers in the Detroit district, um, and they're coordinated internationally with partners in Canada. Those purple bars that you see there represent the range of uncertainty that's expressed in future water levels that reflects uncertainty in what precipitation, air temperature, and other variables across the system might be for the next six months. Now, one of the things we do as a research laboratory, we also, we're not only interested in helping develop these types of computer models that can predict water levels, we're also interested in understanding when they work well and when they don't work well. So again, with a mouse click, I can get rid of the um, record highs and record lows for each month, and then I can add in forecasts from the past for each one of these months. So again, with a mouse click, I'm going to add in here gray vertical bars that represent the three month ahead forecast that were made for each month of the year going back to 2004. And what you can see is that in general, the forecasting system does a reasonable job of forecasting water levels three months out, particularly when water levels fall the strong seasonal cycle. But that there are also periods where the forecasting systems have a really hard time of capturing anomalies. One that I wanna point out in particular here is in 2011 and 2012 on Lake Erie. Uh, if you look right here, these blue dots that I'm tracing represent a remarkable surge in water levels, one of the highest rises in Lake Erie water levels in history uh, that coincided with extraordinary precipitation across Lake Erie. Many of you might remember that there was a record-setting precipitation uh, event that year 
um, that led not only to increased runoff, but also one of the most extensive hard algal bloom events um, in history. You can also see here that at the end of 2011 and, and beginning of 2012, we started on a period of drought um, that was kicked off by this abrupt warming period that led to increased snow melt and a surge in water levels. Those events, um, or the more importantly, the drivers of those events, these big changes in precipitation and changes in temperature, are very hard to predict on time scales beyond two to three months. And that's reflected here in the water level predictions that we see um, that go out two to three months as well. Now I can shift time scales a little bit here and look at a different time of water, different type of water level forecast. Um, we're looking again here at an image from our dashboard tool. The top panel is still Michigan Huron and the bottom panel is still Lake Erie. The blue dots that you see are um, our water level data going back to the early 1900s and the red line again is the long-term average for each system. But I've expanded the time scale for each one of these going way out into the future to 2100 so I can add in long-term projections that come from a range of studies from scientists across the Great Lakes. So with a mouse click, I can add first in the range of expected average water level variability that came from one particular study that was published in 2010 by Jim Angel and Ken Kunkel. And these green bars that you see represent the range of 30-year average water levels across each system. And really, these are meant to be compared the green boxes are meant to be compared to the red horizontal line to the left because they represent the long-term average. The blue dots that you see on the left are there really intended to show what annual variability looks like around those long-term averages. Now, the study that was published um, in 2010 that I'm showing the results from here coincided with some other information from that time period that led to a perception that water levels were very likely to decline in the future due to climate change. But what we found is that as new studies came out and we started adding them to this pool of information, we found that there really wasn't a lot of compelling evidence across all of the different studies that I've now added to the dashboard tool here to make a clear statement about average water levels, about whether they were to rise in the future or whether they were likely to decline. And here's why. In the future for the Great Lakes, climate models expect or anticipate or expect, uh, lead us to expect both an increase in regional air temperatures and also an increase in precipitation. And so what's, what's happening here is there's a trade-off or a balancing act going on between increases in precipitation across the region, um, like the profound increase we saw over the past five years, and increases in air temperature that can indirectly lead to increased water temperatures, increased evaporation rates, and increased water loss from the lake system. What we're trying to do now is develop a better understanding of the details of these models to tease out um, the different signals there. But as of right now, there's really no profound statement we can make about whether or not long-term water levels are going to be higher or lower than they are today. One thing that most scientists uh, and experts agree across the region is that we should continue to expect um, the same type or even more variability in water levels as to what we have in the past. So a few final thoughts before I wrap up. The first point I want to leave everybody with is um, to never overlook the value of data, and in, in the case of the Great Lakes, the extraordinary historical record that we have. The long-term water level record for the Great Lakes is one of the longest continuous records of any hydrologic system on Earth. And as hopefully you've seen today, there's a lot we can learn about what we might expect in terms of future water levels simply by looking at the past and looking at historical variability. The second point I want to make is there are many different combinations of space and time scales where we can look at water level data and look at models. I've shown you a snapshot of a few, but if you're interested in looking at different scales of information, particularly when it pertains to water level data and forecasts near and around islands, please let us know. We'd be happy to help. Third, uh, one of the profound questions that's being raised among the scientific community is whether or not models can ultimately replace observations. Now, personally, I'm a fan of long-term uh, data and monitoring records, but this is a very real question that as models get more and more detailed and more and more complex, can they actually be used as a proxy for observations in reality at a very fine time scale across a system like the Great Lakes? And then last but not least, 
a point that we often make in the modeling community has to do with how we use um, model projections and model simulations and whether or not they should be used for making what we would refer to as predictions or simply if models are intended to offer insight into how a particular scenario, be it a temperature scenario in the future or a precipitation scenario in the future, how that scenario might translate into a potential water level scenario in the future. Uh, we often bounce these ideas back and forth in terms of how and the best way to interpret um, the outcome and the products of, of water level models. So uh, I want to say thank you to all of you for your attention. In particular, I want to thank Matt um, and the folks on the line for Michigan Sea Grant and MSU Extension. The, the data and the information and the graphics that go into a presentation like this wouldn't be possible without a lot of help. Kayla Fond, Joe Smith, Ann Kleitz, and Tim Hunter are just a few of my colleagues who helped make this possible. <clears throat> and then last but not least, I really need to point out that um, even more broadly than that, the data that's collected in the models and the information I presented comes from a broad suite of partners, ranging from Environment and Climate Change Canada, to the Canadian Hydrographic Service, the International Joint Commission, my partners here at NOAA, and also the Army Corps of Engineers and the United States Geological Survey. So again, many thanks for your time and attention. I'll be more than happy to uh, answer any questions as they come up. Thank you, Drew. This is Matt again. Uh, we do have a, a bevy of questions um, my take home from watching that presentation is that it's complex. <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, we have about 10 minutes. Uh, so I, I'll go through a couple of the questions. Uh, Drew and I did talk ahead of time and we don't expect to be able to answer all of these questions in the time remaining. We want to honor your time. We said we would end around uh, 12 Eastern. Um, we will uh, try to type these up and uh, provide some written answers along with the recording. Um, the first question was uh, hoping, Drew, that you could touch on the uh, historical dredging that occurred in the uh, St. Clair Detroit River system and how that affects the water levels. Sure, absolutely. So um, just to sort of repeat and clarify the question, um, as many of you on the phone know, and many of you may not know, um, one of the anthropogenic changes to the Great Lakes system has been um, dredging of, of the channels, uh, in fact, all across the Great Lakes and harbors, marinas. But I think this question has to do with the channels that connect the lakes. And most importantly, um, we often think a lot about the, the channels here in the corridor between Lake Huron and Lake Erie that over time um, have had dredging operations in order to increase the safe navigable depth for the commercial vessels that crisscross the Great Lakes. So over time, the vessels have gotten larger, um, they need a deeper channel, and there have been dredging operations to, at points throughout that channel where a safe navigable depth wasn't possible, dredging operations would commence to increase the navigable depth over time. And there have been a series of projects going back over 100 years um, to, to modify the navigable depth of these channels to ensure the commercial vessels can get through the Great Lakes system. Now, as the, the person with the question notes correctly, um, those dredging operations can have an impact on what we refer to as the hydraulic connectivity of the system. So put a little bit differently or more generally, when you change the rate at which water can flow through these channels, you are going to have a long-term impact on water levels. And there's a wide range of research on impact of the historical dredging operations. But the bottom line is that historical dredging operations on the Great Lakes that have led to increases in navigable depth have had an, an impact on the long-term water levels of the Great Lakes. In general, um, the research has indicated that, that I found points to um, a drop in water levels across the Michigan-Huron system relative to Lake Erie on the range of a foot to two feet or so over that entire time period. One point I like to make is that while that may sound like a lot, um, that long-term change of one foot to two feet due to the changes in navigable depth and the dredging um, really is dwarfed by the type of interannual changes that we see in response to other changes in precipitation and evaporation um, across the system. Now, if you're interested in more information on historical dredging and the timeline, I wanna point you to my colleagues at the Army Corps of Engineers in the Detroit district. They are really the experts on more detailed aspects of those dredging operations. 
Thanks, Drew. Um, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, uh, try to loop together a couple different questions we had that pertain to the um, man's control of the lakes. Uh, so, for example, um, the International Joint Commission, IJC, has some role in um, monitoring or you know, controlling the various control structures. Um, so we had a few questions about that. And then also the dams or the diversions that have been constructed. Um, I think on your previous slide, you showed water coming in and out um, of the system in a couple places. And on top of that, there's, there's more recent events uh, like Waukesha, Wisconsin, the, the surface water diversion for drinking water. Uh, Nestle uh, is a kind of a, a project here in Michigan that, that is high on the news now for groundwater withdrawals. So I, I guess the, the broader question is, how does this, how do these, all of these management actions and government actions um, come together and how do they appreciably affect the Great Lakes water levels? Sure. So we could obviously spend an entire semester um, doing a course on diversions and uh, controls and the regulation of, of water levels. So I'll try to be as succinct as I can. And then hopefully, Matt, we can work together to point people um, to more detailed answers to these questions. So the slide that you show now um, is the baseline for the first part of the answer to the, to the question, which has to do with the control structures on Lake Superior and Lake Ontario. Um, essentially, the, the management of outflows from Lake Superior and Lake Ontario is conducted through a binational agreement between the United States and Canada under the auspices of the 1909 Boundary Waters Treaty. And there are, in fact, um, specific boards of control for Lake Superior and Lake Ontario um, that are operated under the auspices of the International Joint Commission, the IJC, um, that make very clear decisions about how um, not only establish guidelines for how flow is controlled through these systems, but how changes to those guidelines are made over time. Um, I am not, not a direct expert on those changes and how they are made, but many of my colleagues in Environment and Climate Change Canada and the Army Corps of Engineers are. So if people need more detailed information on the, on the components of those regulations and decisions made about them, we'll need to point you to those folks. Now, the second question, the second part of that question had to do with diversions uh, into and out of the Great Lakes system. And for that, I'm going to go to this water balance slide right here. So here we have a summary of all the major ins and outs of the Great Lakes system. And one of the things we wanted to underscore here has to do with the amount of water flow that enters and leaves the Great Lakes through these diversions. Um, the two most significant interbasin diversions, either leaving or coming into the Great Lakes system, are the Chicago diversion down here, you see at the bottom of the page. That's the amount of water on average that leaves Lake Michigan through the Chicago diversion. Um, about, oh, 100 cubic meters per second or so on average, uh, an order of magnitude less than the other major components of the water balance. So um, not entirely insignificant, but very small relative to the other components. One thing that folks don't often know is that it's actually the amount of water that leaves the Great Lakes system through the Chicago diversion is actually a little bit less than the amount of water that enters the Great Lakes from Canada through the Agokian Long Lake diversions on the north shore of Lake Superior, those combined on average are around 200 cubic meters per second on a, on a long-term basis. So that's sort of an indication of, of some of the major diversions and their relative magnitude um, when compared to other major water balance components. And then the last part of the question having to do with the Waukesha diversion is a pretty tricky one. Um, for those of you who haven't read any of Peter Nannan's work, um, the Great Lakes Water Wars is a great um, preclude to that story. Uh, and then I believe um, Peter Andrew is working on a follow-up book that provides uh, an update to that. It's a good in-depth look at all the history behind diversions, the Great Lakes Compact, um, and how diversions are handled um, on a binational treaty basis. But in general, the amount of water at the Waukesha diversion, especially considering that much of it is returned to the Great Lakes system, is not nearly of the same order of magnitude as the numbers that you see on the screen here. That's not to say that the impacts on a local scale aren't profound, um, but at present, some of those smaller diversions, when we look at the entire Great Lakes system, they're not of the same magnitude as the numbers that we're looking at here. All right, thanks, Drew. Um, we've got a minute or two left. Again, thank you everybody for your questions. We have lots of questions. We will summarize these in a document. We unfortunately won't have time to get to them all today, but um, kind of as a, as a final question, 
we wanted to bring it back to island communities. There were a few uh, comments or questions about what local, uh, what, what island communities, the, the municipalities or individual property owners can do to understand what this means for them as an island um, and also what practices they might be able to implement, be it uh, shoreline uh, property owners or infrastructure or whatnot. Um, can you speak to, to that and where people might go? Sure, so I'll, I'll work backwards in the question. Specific guidance on, um, you know, on coastal infrastructure and that sort of thing is a little bit outside of my lane. Um, handling that and adhering to guidance from folks like the Army Corps of Engineers and others um, in, the, in the Canadian federal government system is really the best way to go um, in terms of you know, design of coastal infrastructure. Now, in terms of understanding water level variability as a basis for changing coastal infrastructure, the suggestion that, that we often put forth is number one, as I mentioned earlier, to look at the historical record and see what type of variability we have experienced over the past 20 to 40 years or so. And the second more complex part is to, to look at water level projections um, and try to get an understanding of water level variability changes in the future. And that's a lot of work that we're doing right now with, with partners here in the region. But because it's so complex, the, because water level projections and the relationship of water levels to future climate is so complex, right now some of the best guidance that people can use will be looking at the type of the range of water levels and the rate of variability of water levels in that historical record. Great. Well, thank you, Drew, for that. Um, just wanted to remind everybody that this was a uh, this was our inaugural webinar, and this was a kickoff. This was a very high level introduction to the subject. Um, clearly, there's there's some interest here in digging a little deeper. And um, if this is uh, of interest to you, um, the Great Lakes Islands Islands Alliance does hope to offer additional webinars in the future. Um, so I guess we will close it. For today, I want to thank everybody for attending the, um, the webinar. We hope that it does uh, spur some additional conversations within your, within your community. You will be hearing from us on, uh, via email on a couple subjects. One, we'll let you know when the webinar is ready for viewing. And second, there will be a short optional evaluation for you. Uh, your input will be important to the Islands Alliance going forward as, you know, again, we gauge the interest in having additional webinars and on what subjects. On behalf of the Great Lakes Islands Alliance, thank you for joining us this morning and have a great rest of your day.